Hello there, it's James B. Uh, my special guest this week is Ted Quinlan. He's an amazing guitar player. He was a jazz educator for many, many years at Humber. Just retired from that, but not for music. So, uh, Ted Quinlan is going to be talking about guitars, and I love his playing. Super versatile, wonderful guy, great storyteller. So he's coming up in a minute. Uh, as always, I want to tell you what's in the clubs, and I want to thank my sponsors. Seven Elm Street, what's there? I'll tell you what's there, Barbarian Steakhouse. It's delicious in there. Uh, Captain Paul Barber, barberfinancial.com. If you have a great big company and you want to get benefits for your employees, he could help you. If you're just one person going, should I spend money? Should I put away money? What should I do with my money? He can help you. Captain Paul, barberfinancial.com. And thank you. If you have donated on Patreon, you know who you are. And if you haven't, you could. Five bucks a month, uh, you can go to Patreon and find out all about it. I will be celebrating my patrons. I'm inviting them to some events coming up. And uh, I really am grateful because you don't have to do that. But if you can do five, ten bucks a month, it all adds up. And it really helps me promote these clubs and these wonderful artists. For example, tonight at Lula Lounge, Papiosco y los Ritmicos. Uh, Papiosco is a great percussion player and he's going to have the dance floor packed with, along with DJ Suave. Uh, it's early, you can get in there at 6.30, have dinner, have some dance lessons or come in a bit later and see the band and dance all night long. It's a big party over there at Lula. Same thing on Saturday, Sean Bellavati and Conjunto Lacalu is performing. Sean is a great keyboard player, piano player, and he's going to have some beautiful music there. It's world music, it's salsa, it's Cuban, it's uh, Brazilian, it, it's always like otherworldly at Lula Lounge, especially in winter. It's so cozy in there. I should tell you that Corin Raymond is launching a CD called Dirty Mansions. I just said CD. Uh, and also, Rene Del Cid is performing with a five-piece band on Thursday. Lots to do there. Check out lula.ca. Old Mill Toronto tonight, Richard Whiteman is performing. He is an amazing piano player. I've been playing him for 17 years, way back in the day at Jazz FM when I first started. I played his music with Wild Joyous Abandon. The record was called Grooveyard, big hit in, in uh, Japan as well. And uh, he's put out lots of great records since then. He also plays bass. On this gig, he's playing piano. Kurt Nielsen's on the bass. Morgan Childs is on the drums. And uh, you've probably seen Richard Whiteman play with the Orange Devils, um, uh, Cooker's Quintet, Hogtown Syncopator, so many bands. Uh, also, on Saturday, Monica Chapman is joined by Bartosz Hadala on piano. Uh, gorgeous piano, by the way. Everybody loves the piano at the Old Mill, Home Smith Bar. Um, and also Artie Roth on bass, my little buddy who plays so hard. He's so cool and so happy. you got to see this. Uh, Monica is originally from Romania, and I saw her many years ago. It's been a while. I bet you you'll like it. Check it out. And then John McMurchie is there next week on Wednesday. And on Thursday, Daniel Bado, who is a young, hot guitar player, new kid on the block. I love that they're booking some uh, young talent over there and you can be sure when it comes to the Old Mill and Homesmith Bar it's always good music. You can just trust that Faye Olson will book the right stuff for that room. HughesRoomLive.com, crazy busy over there. I'll try to get this straight, okay? Uh, if you like Tom Waits, the band, Aretha Franklin, Pink Floyd, they have tributes to everybody this week. Tonight, Tom Waits tribute. Uh, I know Genevieve Marantet, my best pal. She's going to be over there. She just played Kerner Hall the other day. Oh my God, she's amazing. Uh, Lori Cullen, one of my favorite singers of all time. I haven't seen her for a long time. She's over there. So that's happening uh, tonight, the Tom Waits tribute at, uh, at uh, Hughes Room Live. And then Saturday and Sunday, a tribute to the band. And then Monday, Dr. Mike Daly presents the Aretha Franklin story. Now, he tells stories and does a lot of research. He's a doctor. He's a smarty pants. Um, and he will also play music. So if you're a fan of Aretha, you'll learn something. You'll hear some great music. And on Tuesday, Martha Chavez is releasing Chunky Salsa, a, a new album of comedy. And she's wonderful. And I love that they have comedy at Hughes Room Live. Who knew? Um, and then Steve Strongman brings blues to the Hughes on Wednesday. And guitarist, singer, uh, David Celia is doing solo acoustic versions of Pink Floyd's The Wall. So, boy, there's a lot to do there. HughesRoomLive.com. Over at Jazz Bistro tonight and tomorrow, Sheila Jordan. Sheila Jordan is like the bebop queen. Uh, she's up from New York. She is incredible. She's one of the last surviving, I think she's about 90. She's one of the last great uh, bebop scat singers out there and 
everybody loves her. She's got so much energy. Um, so that's likely to sell out. Please contact Jazz Bistro, get dinner reservations, and Bob's your uncle. They're, they do have screens upstairs, so there's a chance you can get in, even if you can't get near the stage, and you can still be in the room with this legend and watch her on a big screen. So check it out at jazzbistro.ca. Uh, other things coming up? Well, there's so much coming up. Go to their site, but I do want to mention Dan McCarthy uh, Twenty uh, on the 26th on Tuesday. I'm going to go see this guy. He's a great vibes player. I booked him when he was a kid. He was, I think, maybe... 18 or 19, and he was playing with Frank Wright, who at the time was 70. Frank's now 90. Um, so Frank Wright's a great player. The thing I loved about the vibraphone, everyone's different. Peter Appleyard, the late great Peter Appleyard, played the vibraphone like crazy. Um, who else do I have? Uh, Mark Hundevad, uh, Don Thompson, and uh, Michael Davidson. He's like Lionel Hampton Quick and Gary Burton Slick. And Dan McCarthy also has his completely own take on the vibraphone. All these people are brilliant, and it's always such a cool instrument. So Dan McCarthy is there, and he's there with great vibes with Pat Collin on bass. Uh, Pat Collins is also in Canadian Jazz Quartet. Uh, he's on the bass, and Ted Quinlan on guitar. And speaking of Ted Quinlan, we're going to go see him right now. All the listings are at jazzbistro.ca for all of that, and maybe I'll see you on the 26th. Meanwhile, let's get over and see Ted Quinlan right now. Ted Quinlan! James V. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. It is so nice to see you. Lovely to be Congratulations here. Congratulations on the new record. Thank you so much. Fourth solo record, right? It's it's my third solo record. The oh, right, because the Dickinson counts as a, as a it, duo. It's a duo record, which I right. do consider as one of my records. Yeah. Um, so I think of this as my fourth record. So I want to go over your recordings quickly. First of all, you're known as the most versatile guitar player in the country, probably. Well, doing the best I can. <laughs> well, the first record, As If. Yes. Great record. Did you get a judo for that or a nomination? I got a nomination yeah. for that. Yeah. Because that was a really cool first effort. You're just out of the gate and they're getting a lot of attention. How did you feel when you got nominated for a judo? It was exciting. It was thrilling. I mean, it's, you know, anytime you get, I mean, obviously you're not making these things for thinking about awards. Awards, right. But uh, I think for anybody who does this, as, you know, especially in music like jazz that can often be seen as sort of a fringe music, it's great to get a nod and it's great to get some recognition. It so, could even help you sell tens of records. I definitely cracked the double digits, I think, <laughs> because of that nomination. Yeah. Um, the second record, uh, Streetscape. Streetscape, yeah. Oh, Go West is almost a jazz standard in Canada. Everybody loves that it, song. It's my hit. Yeah. How did you come about writing that song? How, what, what was the inspiration? Because it sounds like Go West. Like The title of the song really fits what it is. Yeah, and I think the title came it came later. I think it came away, it came around the way a lot of the tunes that I write are. They're kind of things that I work out on the guitar. Um, that one is in, in the key of E, which I like to think of as being the middle C of guitar. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really guitar-y thing. It's kind of in the middle between gospel and country music and a bunch of different bags. You kind of feel like there's tumbleweeds through this town and it's a cute town but it's a little bit empty or deserted. Like I'll it, take it. I'm, digging, yeah. I'm totally digging the visual image on <laughs> it. Yeah. All of your music gives me those those images, cinematic images, but Go West, I think, and Streetscape in general, that's just... Great, great. Th th thanks for that. I, I think it's typical of a lot of tunes that I've written where I'll have kind of an A section of the tune that comes to me really quickly. I was kind of just messing around on the guitar in E and I came up with this thing and, and jotted it down and it probably took me another year to write the bridge or to kind of go, you know, what does this tune right. need? And I sort of tried to carry on the melodic motif. And if you look at the worksheets that I have on these tunes, there's probably about six pages with stuff scratched out and erased and arrows drawn around until finally you come up with something that just seems like, well, why didn't I just write that in the first place? But it is that clever bridge that most people just throw a bridge in and it doesn't always work. And so, do you teach composition? I know you taught, like, head of guitar at Humber for many, many years, but do you teach the composition part as well? You know, I never, I never taught composition, but I've worked a lot with my students on, uh, on composing, mm -hmm. and I feel it's a really important other side of the coin for what we do as improvisers. I mean, the cliche, which I agree with, would be that as improvisation is sped up composition, 
composition is slowed down improvisation, where you really have an opportunity. I mean, I think as jazz players, as jazz players, we have to live with imperfection. It's never, you're always winging it. Yeah. Um, even at your best, you're going to listen back to things and go, ah, you know, could have, could, could have. With a tune, you can actually just work away at the thing until you get something that you can sit back and go, okay, I'm happy with that. I'm going to release that to the world. So I've spent quite a bit of time, usually in private lessons, you know, sitting with students, particularly if they bring in material that they're working on, yeah. and give them some feedback, sometimes come up with some ideas or some suggestions. Yeah, it's interesting because you want to make a great composition while you know that you're actually going to be doing all kind of improvs on top of it anyway, but you still have to start with that thing. Well, and, you know, and, and for me, I mean, the, the, the thing that we all look toward is the standard tunes, the Great American Songbook, all of these incredible tunes that were originally written as the popular music of the day that became the fodder for jazz artists to work on. So even though I think the material I write is a lot different stylistically, it comes from a different era and uses different kinds of influences. That whole idea that the melody and the harmony and the form of the tune should be strong is still really important to me. That's what I'm trying to achieve with my writing. With the idea being that ultimately it's a vehicle for improvisation. So, so then the challenge is how to come up with something that is just nice to listen to on its own. It's something pleasant to listen to or enjoyable to listen to but also is a great jumping off point for improvisation and makes sense as an improvisational vehicle. Right. I remember when I started at Jazz FM, I had this silly idea, and it worked, but it sounded crazy on paper. Uh, ten, uh, ten piano players. Yeah. And I would draw, this is the song, uh, that, and these two people are going to come and play it now. I remember you doing that. Right. In, in so it was crazy. That, now, yeah. the thing is, what I did is I went to Mark Eisenman mm. and uh, I think Nancy Walker. I asked a few piano players, yeah. what are songs that are really good to improvise on? Mm. And they explained to me that there are some songs with weird changes that unless you really know the song, it's not a great song right. to improvise right. over. So I got this short list down and that's why it worked. So the, the, the thing about... Uh, uh, Improvising something simple is it suddenly becomes not so simple, right? Sure. Which is what you're saying is when you're writing the song, you want the hook to be good enough, but also not to have to be played the same way. A absolutely, and, and I think you know one of the things that that I find the longer that I've played and, and just comparing notes with with my peers is that the tunes that I used to think of as as simple tunes in terms of maybe a simple form where the chord changes aren't that complex, say compared to uh, you know, giant steps or your tunes that are real textbook d difficult tunes end up becoming the most challenging tunes to improvise on, you know, convincingly to find material that that fits those simpler kind of chords. I mean, a great example is uh, Thelonious Monk tunes are a great example. Yeah. He wrote these brilliant tunes, they're kind of quirky. A lot of them have deceptively simple melodies. I mean, there's a whole range of tunes that he wrote, but there are a number of them that are not that complicated right. harmonically, but to sound convincing and to sound like you've really understood the tune and gotten inside it when you're improvising is that's, really that's challenging. The challenge. Yeah, right. You know, conversely, um, you know, if I think of, I mean, I use Giant Steps as an example. I mean, obviously, a textbook tune, and you know, everybody has the Coltrane solo in their head as a, you know as as a point of reference. I mean, it's not an easy tune to play on, but if you can make the changes, you're going to sound pretty Smart. good. Pretty good. <laughs> right, yeah, um, yeah. Playing convincingly on a 12 bar, bar blues in a bebop format is really challenging, and yet that's one of the first forms that we learn as improvisers. Yeah. One of the most basic things there is. And yet putting all of that sort of hipness of the bebop language together with the you know, the earthiness and the soulfulness of the blues tradition is, is a challenging thing to do well. Absolutely. Now, the record with Brian Dickinson, your third album. Yeah. Really pretty music, just piano and guitar. Yeah. And you can't really tell who, you, you do have a monk tune on there, but you can't really tell which songs are yours and which ones are Brian's because you really meld together. I mean, was that, did that just come about or was that intentional? I think it's just the way things are, and and uh, I mean Brian and I have been friends for a long time. We've worked together a, a lot through the years. I'm thrilled to have him on this this new record that I've done. Um, we like a lot of the same stuff. We share a lot of similar tastes. 
I think that even with our original writing, there's kind of a thread that runs mm -hmm. to it of the kind of composers that we like listening to. I mean, also that record, you know, the the um, the, the, the sort of prototype for that duo record um, is the Bill Evans and Jim Hall, Undercurrents and Intermodulations, which are, I mean, that's a real desert island record for me, and, and I know it is for Brian too. I mean, that's right. a record. And I can that, hear it now that you say it. I'm like, yeah, that that really. I mean, we could both probably sing all of the solos on that record, and uh, so I think in our minds that was well this has been done let's see how we can do something maybe maybe with that in mind but do something different in with your it. own way um moon shower is a favorite tune i Thank love you. that one Thank now you. i tried a moon shower and i still felt dirty um no i'm, I'm wondering that's why i wrote the tune <laughs> <laughs> I, when I listened the first thing when i saw it i immediately thought of a play on words on sunbathing and then a moon shower but I, I don't know how that title came about. You know, I mean, the, the titling thing is such a weird thing, especially with instrumentals. Instrumentals, things, you're right. You know, I play around with things. I mean, sometimes I will just write down, if I think of a title, I'll write it down and keep it in a little notebook and then find a, a tune that kind of suits it. Right. Um, other times, I remember that was, I mean, it was a play on words, Moon Shower. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact inspiration for it. But, but it I, works with the song. This, most of your songs that I can think of, the title reflects the sound, but it's also clever, and that's kind of rare. There are, I think with a lot of instrumentals, it does, I can't remember the song if the title doesn't fit for me. You're trying to, I mean, even if it's not a real literal thing, it's more like a vibe or a mood mm -hmm. that, that I'm trying to get across yeah. with, with, with the title. And I think it speaks to the idea of trying to get the music to communicate, and there's lots of ways to get it. Right. To, and to one is a title that you automatically go, I wonder what this is going to sound like. Yeah. You know, I think it's really important, especially with instrumental music, because there's no hook. You know, there's no repeated thing. I think if you've written a tune that has lyrics, it's usually pretty obvious what the what title the wants to be, because be, yeah. it gets repeated a bunch in the, right. in, in the lyrics of the tune. And with instrumentals, that just doesn't exist. So it's really, what does it feel like? What does it, what does it sound like? Yeah. You know. So you're from Montreal originally. Yeah, I grew up there. What was the early? What were the early records that made you go, boy? I better pick up a guitar and make something with my life. Well, I'm. I mean, I'm a '60s kid. Like I grew up it, during that time. So when the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan, mm -hmm. I was one of, I'll guess. 30 million people in the world who started playing the guitar. <laughs> right. You know, right at that time, I would have been around 10, I guess, when I saw them. I got my first guitar at 11. And it was all that music that was big in the mid 60s the Beatles, the Stones. I was at the age, I think I was about four years old, and I yeah. was at the age where I just didn't understand why all the girls were screaming and how they could hear themselves. I didn't actually get that they were like going to be the big rock stars of the future. When I first saw the Beatles, I didn't get it. I just thought, wow, those girls are screaming. Like, how can they hear what they're playing? No, 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 totally. But I didn't, I didn't hear the music side. I wasn't thinking this is the new invasion. Well, yeah. and to hear them speak, they couldn't hear themselves. Play. Right. Like, it's actually amazing to watch, mm -hmm. um, you know, the footage from, from Shea Stadium, I, I, I think mm -hmm. it was. Was. And they sound great. They played a written, and the girls are screaming like crazy. They didn't have PAs or monitors like we have. They had their little Vox amps on the stage, and probably the kind of PA system that we used to play at a high school. Now, right. That was for Shea Stadium, and 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 the Fab said in the interview we couldn't hear ourselves. So, yeah. But they they got their ten thousand hours in in Hamburg, and they exactly were right. To, they were tight without. They they could do it blindfold. They were a great yeah. band. Yeah. 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 So the were, Beatles were a big influence to picking up a guitar. Absolutely. And then, the jazz side of that? Okay, so it all happened really quickly, and, and, and I very quickly got into, from the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix, um, Eric Clapton, Cream, those, those were bands right. that I saw live back you know, in the heyday. Yeah. And then it was a really quick route. Uh, a high school buddy of mine, probably around the time I was 14, gave me a copy of Boss Guitar by Wes Montgomery. And that was the game changer, right? right. And, and, and yeah. it was kind of cool because I'd been listening to, you know, all the pop music I had been listening to, as well as Hendrix and Clapton. Also around the same age, I got listening to B.B. King, all the Kings, Freddie mm -hmm. King, um, um, Albert King. Mm -hmm. So I, I was, I become more familiar with kind of where Hendrix and Clapton were coming from. And then I heard Wes, and it 
even though I didn't understand what he was doing, it made sense to me on kind of a basic level. I could yeah. hear the blues in it. Yeah. I could hear the blues, but I went, what are these different notes that he's playing? And what a beautiful the sound. Tone, the right. tone, right. The tone under that guitar was I mean, just his. It, it's and I don't know if it was true, the story about the, the corn on the thumb that he used. I don't know if that's like the full story, but... I've, well, I mean, aside from being a brilliant talent, who knows? Mm -hmm. It's only been in recent years that I've been able to see videos of Wes playing and look at them really closely and, and, and try to figure out what he was doing. I still don't fully understand it. People who saw him play a lot do say that there was this callus on the thumb that acted like a bit of a flat pick. Right. right. And uh, I mean, I'm not. You know the YouTube sure. thing you bring up. That's really cool because in YouTube, um, kids these days, kids these days. <laughs> when I was young, I had to do drugs and go to concerts. I didn't have the YouTube. But but the YouTube, the kids can watch Art Tatum yeah. or anybody with footage, and they can study and look and look and look. When we were young. You could either see a band live, you might catch them on the Mike Douglas show or one TV special, yeah, yeah. and that was it. Mike so the Douglas influence, show, that's great. right? Because yeah. the influence was was long lasting, but you really couldn't study it. For example, I loved Liberace. Right. I saw him play once. Yeah. I saw him on TV twice. That's about it. Yeah. So I can't play piano, but I dress funny. Right? But kids these days, they can study <laughs> so Liberace. Nice and and they can get really good. Right, <laughs> right. right. I remember, I mean, and this was as an adult person when I, during the time I lived in Vancouver, going to see George Benson play at uh, the Queen Elizabeth Theatre and bringing my binoculars. Right. Because I had to. I was going through a real Benson phase. I wanted to sound like Benson. I'd been transcribing some of his solos. But I needed to see him do it, and I sat there with the binox mm. and, 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 and watched the show. That was how I had to do it. So that was like the days of Breezen? Was that his, it was, it was that, kind of yeah, he foray had, little into smooth, but not too smooth? He, yeah. he had crossed over at that point yeah. and, and become a pop star um, and still played right. at an incredible level in the right. concerts. I mean, it, 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 this is what I couldn't believe. I'm in North Bay and his voicings are really complicated. And people would just love it. Yeah. And they didn't even know, but it resonated. Like you said, sometimes music just has to hit you in the right place. Yeah. You don't have to understand it. Yeah. And you know, it was interesting because I. I watched with the binoculars and I watched him play and I saw how, obviously this was from many thousands of hours of practicing, but how easy it was for him to do the things that he did and how natural they were for George. And at that point I stopped trying to sound like George Benson. <laughs> right, because you realized... This... I went, that's yeah. his thing, but I really had to see it live and watch it be done and watch the, beautifully, the beautiful mastery of it and just how much that was him, mm -hmm. it kind of freed me actually right. to go, oh, maybe you should work on finding your own thing. So you're in Montreal and you end up in Berkeley. You go to Berkeley for school. I was at Berkeley for, I, I have a very kind of scattered post-secondary uh, educational history. Yeah. I was at Berkeley for a semester mm -hmm. uh, around the time I turned 20 when I was in Boston. So I was there for, for four months. Mm -hmm. I was there at the same time that Pat Metheny came up from the University of Miami and started, he was around the same age as I am, yeah. and started teaching at Berkeley. So we were all enthralled by this guy who was the same age as uh, all of us kids. And we had so and, many ideas. Oh, right? and he was just yeah. playing at this, at, at, at this incredible level. Gary Burton had brought him up to mm -hmm. teach at Berkeley. And I went back to Montreal after that and went up to see the Gary Burton band playing. And sure enough, who was playing guitar in the band was Pat Metheny, which made com complete sense. Right. And, and of course, that was really the beginning of it. I remember thinking at the time, boy, this guy's really good. I'm glad to see he got a good gig. And of course, he's gone on to be you know, hugely rich and famous. Yes, an incredible career. Yeah. 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 Um, at some point, you were you, being sidebanned to some people like... Uh, uh, was it Freddie Hubbard? Did you play with him? I got to play. I, I, I lived in Vancouver um, for a stretch. I did play with Freddie Hubbard. I got to play with Chet Baker. Chet Baker, what was that like? It was amazing. And uh, that was towards the end of his career or, or in the middle? It was later. He died, I guess, a few years after that. Not a long time after that. I mean, he mm -hmm. died in an accident quite, yeah. uh, quite tra tragically. It was incredible. It was, um, I mean, it was an honor to get to play with, with Chet. He played beautifully. Um, he was a fun hang. Did you see the Chet Baker movie with yeah. Ethan Hawke? Yeah. Wasn't he great? 
I was freaked me out. I thought I was looking at Chet Baker. He was after fantastic. A while. He, he yeah. did an incredible job of playing that, that. That whole movie was really well done, and uh, and Kevin Turcott did an incredible job right. of, of, of playing the trumpet parts. Right. So it's Kevin Turcott, local guy, pretending he's playing Chet Baker, and also. Coaching Ethan to coaching look like Ethan he's playing. Actually, look like he's playing the trumpet. And the only time Ethan actually played the trumpet in that scene, or in that movie, do you know what it was? I, the scene in the bathtub when he had broken his together. Uh, he was supposed to play badly, and he said, "Please let me do it in this." And all he had to do was probably try and play as well as he could. For, <laughs> right, <laughs> for right, for right which scene, was right. actually bad. Right. But uh, anyway, I, I wondered that because if if you work with Chad and you saw that movie. Uh, that re they really captured it. I was blown away. I thought so. Yeah, I, I thought he did a fantastic job. He'd obviously, I, I'm, I'm assuming that Ethan Hawke had studied Let's Get Lost, right, and seen a lot of the footage of of, of, of Chet speaking. Yeah, but I thought he did a great job of capturing. When Chet. you played with these guys uh, out west, you would have been how old in your in my twenties? Yeah, yeah. In, in my twenties, let, let me think. Freddie Hubbard I played with at a jazz festival in Whistler right before moving to Toronto. I think I would have been 31 there. Mm -hmm. Chet was in, in my 20s. I also played with Eddie Harris, the great saxophone mm -hmm. player, who I was a huge... I was huge fans of all of these people. They were, they were my idols, and mm -hmm. it, was, it was really thrilling to get to, to get to play with them. So you came to Toronto, and then at some point, because you, you've been teaching, I mean, you're just retired now, but you've yeah. been teaching for a long time. How long at Humber? I was at Humber for a total of 26 years, two wow. of them were part-time, and yeah. then I had the, the, the job as the head of the guitar department for, for 24 years. So it was a good, Right. I had a great run at it. Did you have any, and this is always a touchy question because you'll, you'll think of two now and think of five later, but a couple of students that you really were proud of and said, this person's going to skyrocket out of this class. Oh, I mean, so, so many of them, a, a number of the people who are teaching at the school right now are former students of right. mine. So um, several of the guitar players who were on the guitar faculty there were students of mine who are fantastic players. Who said the head now? Um, Jocelyn Gould, who's a fantastic guitar player, a Canadian guitar player from Winnipeg, who had been living in, um, is still spending quite a bit of time in New York, I think, mm -hmm. um, and she's taken over the job and uh, looks like she's doing a fantastic job of it and, yeah. uh, and, and, and is a great player. And you, when you retire from teaching, you don't retire. You're just retiring from home. You're still out playing, making records and doing everything. Thank right? you for clarifying that. <laughs> the, the, the R word has been scaring me lately. Right. And I, I just want to make, hello world, <laughs> yeah. I'm available. available. <laughs> exactly. I'm still, I, I, I I basically quit my day gig to say right. As so musicians don't retire exactly. And and your uh, latest record uh, is just dreamy. Tell us about who's on it. The uh, the brand new record. It's, the record's called Absolutely Dreaming, and it drops. Absolutely dreamy. Yeah, for me to listen to. Yeah, it, it drops as we say now yeah. in, in in the biz. This this business called show on a November 29th. It's Brian Dickinson on piano, who we were talking about. Uh, Kieran Overs on bass and Ted Warren on drums, all old friends of mine. Um, I was going to ask how you select because, man, you work with so many good people and on different records here to there, and I, I always wonder how you decide what you're going to do. In a perfect world, I could do a record every year, two records a year, but that's not the world that we live in, and yeah. I, I fund these records myself. So when I started thinking about recording the first record as if um, I had Ted and Kieran as the rhythm section, I just had an intuitive feeling from, from playing both with, with both of them that A, they're fantastic musicians, and my tastes are pretty eclectic. I, lot of, I like a lot of different stuff, and I'm trying to put it together under the loose heading of jazz, so I needed players who could really do those different things and do them convincingly and, uh, and and work together well. And the comfort level of friendship too just and they, means you're going to They're have my fun. friends. Yeah. I mean, we get along great as people. It's always an excellent hang. Mm -hmm. um, same with Brian. So Kieran and Ted have been the rhythm section on all my records. Yeah. I started off doing a, a quintet record on As If, then a trio record with Kieran and Ted, then a duo record with Brian. And now, now, now a quartet record with the whole band put together. Yeah. So there, there's a semi-logical. And are these songs there. recent or are they? Because it does. It sounds like a bit of a combination of your last two records in a way. It's it's I, the prettiness of, with the Dickinson, and then the really memorable 
uh, lines of, of the streetscape. Thanks. There, I would say most of the tunes were written in the year leading up to the record. So it was recorded about a year ago yeah. and, and just came out now. A few of them are tunes that I've had kicking around for a little while, for, for, for a few years longer. There's um, a waltz on it called Babylon. Um, it's the, the fourth, fifth track on the record. That's a tune that I've had kicking around for a while and it was time to finally record it. Most of it's pretty recent and, and in terms of Stylistic. I, I, the thing that I've heard said is that people have, if they're lucky, three or four or five tunes, and they keep rewriting those three or four or five <laughs> right, tunes. Right. So I think, without even trying, there's sort of a style I that just reflects it, yeah. Yeah. my particular tastes of the kinds of melodies I like and the kinds of chords that I try to put together. I'm trying to make this stuff as different as I possibly can, but I think we all have. I think you find your style almost by accident. You said the same about George Benson too, so it's good. You find your style and you're like, yeah, this is the way I like to sound and the things I like to play. Mm -hmm. Although, I've booked you several times for filling in gigs and sub gigs and this and that, and you always, like with the Tiki Collective, those live shows, you just walked in and took over Eric St. Laurent's chair like that. So well, the versatility doesn't hurt, right? Well, thanks. Eric's a fantastic mm -hmm. guitar player. I, I, mean, I love stepping into different kinds of situations and just trying to do a good job of it. That's part of the, that's the craft part of it. It's playing. probably why you love playing with the Canadian Jazz Quartet. Totally. That is a band that is so important, and I'm glad they have the name Canadian Jazz Me Quartet too. because they are all that's right about Canada. So getting to play Frank Wright, still playing vibes. He's got a, he's over eighty now, right? Frank's ninety. Now. Ninety, like and playing he's incredible. At the top of his form, schlepping the vibes into the gig, putting yeah, yeah bringing them in himself, t taking yeah. them apart playing at an incredibly high level, a, a constant inspiration. Peter Alpier did the same thing. He'd bring in his own yeah. vibes. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're older, just keep doing what you do. Yeah. And then Don Vickery, where he can have brushes, sticks, or hands just popping out, like he's like a magic man on the oh, drums. He's fantastic. Uh, you know, I mean, they're lovely people. He's a hard swinging drummer. I mean, they really play. It's, it's the and it's of, usually now Pat Collins on bass, Pat right? Collins. Yeah. That's right. And then you have a guest every time CJQ play. That's right. They have a special guest. So your set list is pretty much probably the longest repertoire of any band I can think of in Canada. I guess. And we never know what it's going to be. We kind of show... I mean, occasionally you'll get somebody who sends us a little email list of tunes. Usually it's like show up on the gig and count the tune in. Yeah. Sometimes the title's coming along as the tune's getting counted in, which is a huge <laughs> part of the fun of it. Right. It's really without a net. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to think on your feet and, and, and hopefully know enough tunes, or at least somebody in the band knows the tunes. What are some of your other favorite, maybe not regular gigs, but semi-regular gigs, people that ask you to sit in with them? What are some of your favorite? I mean, there's, I mean I'm so lucky to play with a bunch of different great musicians here in town, and I was just thinking about a couple of things I have coming up playing with different bands. Mm -hmm. I'm rehearsing with Mark Kelso's band tomorrow and uh, we're playing a gig at the Jazz Room in, in Waterloo. On the Love weekend. that room. Yeah. A really beautiful listening room with a great piano. Yeah, yeah. so he's a, a good friend, fantastic drummer and has some really nice material so that's a fun band to Two play Two records with. in three years or something? Yeah. He, yeah, he he's, got busy lately. He's, he's, he's cranking him <laughs> out. Uh, Mike Downs, I play in his, in his band with Robbie Botosh and Larnell Lewis. We have a gig coming up at the end of the month at uh, Gallery 3, 4, 5. Really? Yeah. And, and, wow, and that's a big, like, that, that room is magic, but it's kind of a small room for such a famous foursome. It'll, I'm, I'm sure it'll Robbie will love the piano. Yeah. 1960 Baldwin yeah. piano, that is a beautiful, that's beautiful good. Room. And we've played there before and it's worked out cool. really well. So, so, when so. is that? What's the date on that? Is it the you said end of November? It's the end of November, I think. If I maybe it's the thirtieth. It's the end of the month, anyways. It'll be in the liner notes underneath, folks, on this YouTube clip here. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also I'm just thinking of things that are coming out. Dan McCarthy is a great vibes player. Yes. He used to be one of our students at the college. And Played uh, a duet with Frank Wright when he was 
21 and Frank was 72 or something. And I remember also, that. at the surprise party for Frank's 90th birthday, Dan showed up and did some playing at that party Amazing. too, so many years later. And then he moved to New York for a while? He lived in New York for a long time. I got to hang out with a, a bit with him during my time there. And, uh, Brand new record for him. He's mm -hmm. now moved out and I'm on his new record. We're yeah. playing at the Jazz Bistro on November 26th. Beautiful. With, uh, with, with, with that group. That's the day before I leave for Cuba. I will be there. Okay, come on awesome. down. Awesome. Uh, I play in Nancy Walker's band, which is a fantastic band. Uh, Ted Warren's group. Uh, Mandy Lydon's Origins oh, group. Oh, that's uh, a heavy uh, one, play, too. Uh, all the Joni Mitchell material. There's a bunch of really cool, fun bands yeah. that, that I get to play yeah. with. So you are not retired. Let's just put that. You you just don't do one job one of all time. the things. Not retired. <laughs> <All right. laughs> when people say that for a jazz musician, I'm pretty sure they don't mean it. It's it's it's, it's kind of scary. Right. Yeah, yeah. Musicians don't retire. We I think we die with our boots on. That's right. Yeah. It's only fair. Yeah. Well, I love your record. I'm so glad Thank to you, talk James. to you. Do you have any advice for young people right now in this industry trying to make a living? It's such a radically different time now. One of the things that I'm really heartened to see is how well my former students put it together when they get out in the world. Um, you've really got to be your own boss. You've got to be very proactive right. about what you do. Um, you've got to be more of a business person than I ever had to be, and which I definitely am not. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I've seen a lot of people doing that and doing a good job of it. So I think you're wearing a lot of hats now, a lot more than musicians traditionally had to wear in the past. Um, I'm not one of the people who would say that there's no scene. I think there's a really healthy scene out there. I think there are things for people to do. Like a lot of musicians, I worry about the effect of, of streaming on the kind of income stream that we're right. used to having. Right, the live people. scene's fine, but trying to get paid for a recording yeah. is real hard. I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that that ship has sailed, and that's kind of the way things are now, so people are looking at different ways of putting it together. I see um, my younger peers doing a lot of the same things that I, th th that I did, which is taking every gig they could get, Mm -hmm. um, being involved in a lot of different things, teaching, doing other kinds of right. jobs. And also when these people go it. out to the clubs to see other musicians, it's hard economically to always do that, but mm -hmm. that's how they get other pickup gigs, is by going out supporting other people and seeing other bands. So it's kind of like you have to get out there, whether you can afford Lots of cover charges or drinks or not, you've got to find... Like they say, out of sight, out of mind. It's mm -hmm. good. You've got to be visible. You've got to be seen. There are certainly, with the new technologies, there's lots of ways of putting our music out there. Yeah. And, and these are things I'm learning, even just doing this new record, in terms of trying to get some visibility for the music. And I think that's great, and that's really healthy. Mm -hmm. And I think younger players are all over that. Right. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about writing a book? Whether it's about theory, whether it's about your life, or whether it's about advice for people to... I thought about, a couple of years ago, I was doing record reviews and whole note, and that was a fun thing, because I, I like to write. Yeah. Um, here's the short answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if I would like to write a book. I think I would like to do some more writing, and I'm not sure what the topic would be. I do like writing about music. And you gotta love Whole Note. I mean that oh. whether you're jazz or classical, especially classical, but that that magazine has so many interesting reviews and articles and such up to date listings. It's it's a bible for musicians and people that wanna see classical or jazz, yeah. right? It's fantastic. And at the time that I was doing the reviews it was just an opportunity to exercise that writing muscle, and I only stopped because I just needed the time back to get re ready for making a new record. Yeah, and uh, that that was the only reason I stopped doing it. Well, I maybe it's a good thing it. to go back to because people that know your music will absolutely read your reviews and have a lot more trust than someone they've never met. I thought usually with with our, with 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 writers, you get to know their byline, but it takes you time to figure out. Okay, this person has this idea, but what do I think of this person's taste in music? I liked the idea that it was another musician writing the review, and so without getting overly technical, I could really talk about the music from a jazz musician's perspective. perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Well, I can't wait to see you playing with Dan McCarthy. Every time you're playing uh, with Botosh and the crew, that, I mean... And I'm going to hype a couple of other gigs really quickly. All right. I'm playing with my own group at the, ja at the Jazz Room in Waterloo, December 14th, and uh, that'll be a CD release. Cool. Also that's a Saturday night. That's a Saturday night, also at the Rex on d uh, January 2nd and 3rd. So right after the new year, we'll be there with the band. So I would encourage people to come on out. That sounds amazing. And congrats on the record. I Thanks so much, the new record. Ted Quinnen. Well. He was great. Um, we're going to have another great guitarist next week, Eric St. Laurent. My favorite guitar player to work with. He has written charts for so many projects I've been doing, and I just love this guy's playing. Uh, and he's got quite the story. So join me next week for Eric St. Laurent. And meanwhile, thank you. Please get out there and support great live music wherever you are.